book, so we call it later. Um, we are ambassadors of the Chatbot Summit, so you can get 20% discount. And uh, uh, if you also want to be a speaker, then this, uh, we can connect you to the organizers. And same thing uh, is for uh, Green Work in Amsterdam. Um, we got a special discount for the community in the Machine Intelligence Summit. Uh, and also, you, you can speak. I don't know if they, they have still uh, spots left, but uh, they should be. Uh, Four promotions about DataCamp. So, DataCamp provides training, online courses, uh, mainly on Python and R, on the data science of Python and R. And we also arrange a special prize with the members. That's it. So we are on any social channel, uh, all, one of, all of the popular social channels. So feel free to take picture and mention us and share. Uh, so we want to keep the media involved and uh, you know, going on. That's it. And uh, now I will, uh, I'll. Uh, I'll ask for the, our host and sponsor of this event, which is Team Big. So let's let's thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Greetings. We're glad to be here. My name is Max Goff. I am a principal with the Think Big Academy. We've, I've been here with my colleague, Dr. Rob Snowden <laughs> Lambert. He's a multi volunteer man about town. So, you know, he's a science fiction fan and part time hacker. Was a hacker? Or <laughs> Not a part time hacker. Full time hacker. Full time hacker. Full -time hacker. <laughs> so, we're with Think Big Analytics, and we're very pleased to be helping sponsor this meetup here in uh, Think Big Analytics. We don't want to take too much time to talk about us. We want to give as much time as we can to, to our our key speaker here, Laura. But a little bit about I think we is a uh, big data only service provider. We were the first to be the only big data service provider on the planet. The very first to offer uh, the technology agnostic approach to focusing on solutions that are based on client data. That's really what our focus was. We're not management consultants. We're not financial consultants, we're data consultants. That's what we do. We were started in 2010. We were acquired by Teradata in 2014. It was a strategic uh, partnership, a strategic buyout that occurred. And since then, we, the reason we think big founders were motivated to take the deal was to get the investment capital in order to grow. And that growth since the acquisition has been phenomenal. We we have gone from across that area 300. The last time this slide was presented, we were 300. We're now at 1,000. That's how fast we're growing. We uh, base everything around a market texture that we call velocity, the velocity framework. That includes several different buckets of offerings, architecture roadmap. So we go in and do an analysis and figure out how a client can use their data, which we had a, a prize winning. A uh, product that was just announced earlier this year. It's not a product, it's open source. It's called Kylo. Maybe you've heard of it. This project accelerator, something to allow for creation of huge multi petabyte data lakes in a relatively short time. We've also got great uh, uh, services and lease ops. Uh, we also have training, the Academy does, and uh, our managed services as well. Think big, start smart, scale fast. That really summarizes very succinctly what it is we do. Think big. Don't think about just a use case or saving a few dollars using uh, big data technology. Think about a sustainable competitive advantage based on your data. That's the audacious approach we take with our clients. A sustainable competitive advantage. Because it's based on client data, that's a promise we can help them realize. Technology may change. Moore's law may continue, but what won't change is that ownership of data. As long as a client has data and they can leverage their data to find the value that's latent, hidden in that data, they can create a sustainable competitive advantage. Start smart. What we do, based on having done hundreds 
and client engagements with big, big companies. We figured out those best practices and patterns that allow us to replicate some of those best practices with new engagements. We have project accelerators like Cotton. We have others coming for data science that, that help us get started faster so that companies can scale fast. So that's more than just a, 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 a tagline. It's actually how we do business. Think big, start smart, scale fast. And then I have a pyramid, because we have to have pyramids. And Bob, what is this about? What is the pyramid? Thank you, Alex. <laughs> Hello, everyone. So I also like to do karaoke, so I'm very happy with the, uh, with the microphone in my face. That's really good. So the, the question about us from what we're seeing now is really, where do we operate? Do we do like uh, small scale things? Do we do engineering only? Do we do data science only, something like that? Well, actually, we do everything. Let's think big. We think big, right? We do uh, implementations of Hadoop ecosystems, data lakes, petabytes of data, that kind of scale. Right? We'll build the thing for people. We'll then uh, run operations on top of that, or manage services, or whatever, or we'll do consultancy uh, on top of that. We'll help people build a great data lake. We'll help them operationalize analytics. So that's really that's really pretty cool. That's where I specialize in, actually, making that uh, analytics, those models run in production, real time, high data volumes, things like that. We call analytics ops. And then really the tip of that pyramid, what we are really excelling in right now is that uh, deep learning uh, sort of area, artificial intelligence, you know, people have lots of words for this uh, sort of area. And we'll hear a lot more from Laura about that uh, in just a minute. But uh, well, what, are we, what are we doing there? Well, you'll hear about uh, self-driving cars. We're doing uh, deep learning for fraud detection. We're doing it mostly it's, uh, it's TensorFlow, right? It's open source. It's, uh, it's really cool on massive, massive data sets. Uh, hundreds of thousands of transactions. So, Rob, yeah. other than eating pizza and listening to an awesome talk, what do we want people to do? Well, we'd really kind of like you to join us. <laughs> so, uh, so we, uh, we're actually, we're hiring. But also, if you have any projects you'd like to do with us, that's fantastic. Please do uh, come and talk to us, see what to do a project doing, and, and uh, let us help you and help us do, uh, do the projects. But we're hiring all types of people. We have a big vision. We think big about how to do data science. Yes, we do. Yes, we do. So we need all types of people. We're building a diverse global team of international people flying all around doing the best projects in the world. Right? Doing self-driving cars in Japan, doing self-driving cars in, in the Netherlands, doing, uh, doing fraud detection all around Europe, etc. So uh, what we need is people with diverse backgrounds. So we need data scientists, that's for sure. If you're all data scientists here, that's great. We also need data engineers and business experts. We need uh, BI professionals. We need data architects. We need uh, data, uh, data, we need all kinds of everything. We need uh, thought leaders. We need uh, open source evangelists. We need, uh, we need project leaders. We need project managers. We need absolutely everything. So if you know somebody and they're good, please send them our way. careers <laughs> Go there, have a look around, and if you're interested, we'd love to hear from you. So you can remember our name. We've got some uh, nice goodies for you to take away these nights, so please do take the stuff. It's free. <laughs> right. yeah. I also want to introduce our, uh, uh, our next speaker. So, uh, Laura. Oh, yes. Before, I think before we move to the next speaker, I just realized maybe we need to do a little bit of pics of the setup. Because the, I've seen the lights that are very on, on the recording. You can't see the text. Okay. Yeah. Would you like to turn on the light on the screen? Uh, that would be fine. Yeah, sure. We'll do that. Sure. So it would help? Uh, yeah. And also, I don't know if I'm asking for the people on the back. Uh, we need to move closer, then we have plenty of space. We're going to get close to the. Okay. It's up to you. <laughs> I wasn't on that line, I didn't really read, so I'm guessing that people are back. It's very bright now. I think everybody up for real life. Okay, that's close as possible. Okay. 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 Okay.
It's all white. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I was like, well, yeah. I think some people came all the way from It's pretty, it's pretty far, pretty much another planet. <laughs> We need to kill these lights over here, right? Yeah. No, that's the one you get. Fabio? Yeah, there's a bit of delay. Yeah, that's better. You just need to get tighter, I think. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I think it's. Are we good? So, um, I think it's Laura. We've known Laura for, for several, several awesome months. And, uh, I think uh, the most interesting things about Laura when she speaks Japanese, she has a, uh, a PhD in applying machine learning to human brains. <laughs> pretty, pretty awesome. Now she studies a different type of brain, artificial intelligence, deep learning, applying deep learning to uh, create self-driving cars with us. I think big, so go ahead, Laura. Hey, Vera. Hello, everybody. So um, I grew up said my name is Laura. I do not speak Japanese. Apparently, common misconception. I'm trying to learn. That's true. Do not speak. Um, so um, I will um, try to um, give you a, a bit of um, an overview of uh, artificial intelligence in companies. Um, where did it come from? Where are we some applications? And uh, where do we see this going? So um, but first of all, so companies have of course not just started to use data, um, but it started somewhere else. It start, started just um, trying to describe what's happening now with descriptive things, and then moving on to more predictive. So now we know what's going on now. We say something about what will happen in the future, so that we might be able to react. Then uh, along came the internet. Um, so um, real-time models started to be more interesting, um, frequency, um, high-frequency trading, um, how much I bid uh, to put an app on this website that the person was just about to visit, so a uh, millisecond um, time scale. Um, so, so that was sort of moving from um, these descriptive statistics to having models that could run and run continuously on systems. And then after that, it, it, people, people realized it would also be nice to have these models um, update themselves as new data came in. So this was sort of the next step in using data in companies. Uh, so being able to deploy a system that has a model that can update when new data comes in. And then after that, the sort of where we see um, the current statuses with the next step artificial intelligence. So of course, we've been here for some years now it's not like entirely new, but a lot is happening in this field. So, so why, why now? Why, um, why all this hype um, about artificial intelligence and, and deep learning now? Because it's not, a, it's not a new research field. It's been around since the 1940s, actually. Um, it started um, yeah, in the 1940s, and then a lot of people got very interested in it, a lot of work was done. And then people got disappointed and uh, no one really worked with it. And then interest sort of um, came back and people worked with it for an interest in time. And now, um, in 2006, interest really picked up again. And in 2012, was also sort of um, a, a milestone um, with some really important uh, advantages within the field. Uh, so, so that it's now really. And it's, it's not really an active field of research and application again. And there are several reasons for this. Uh, so the hardware, before in the 1940s, the hardware was only good enough to have very few neurons in a, in a neural network. And with only few neurons, you can't really learn a lot. You have to have a lot of neurons to be able to try to model uh, the world correctly. So that's one of the reasons that it's really picking up again now. We have better hardware. Also, we have more data. Data is really important for neural networks. With the internet, everything's being recorded. This is being recorded. Or always, everything's recorded. We have a lot of data to train neural networks on. 
And with their hardware and the data, research got more interesting and companies got more interested and started investing. Google, uh, Microsoft, Facebook. So there are all these uh, factors coming together now to drive the virtuous cycle. And uh, this is um, just a graph to sort of prove the point. Uh, so, so this, uh, the y-axis shows the number of mentions of artificial intelligence in um, reports from companies, and the x-axis shows time. And uh, this really looks like it's potential growth, right? It's, it's really amazing. Uh, another, um, so there was a quote from a partner earlier this year that they predict by 2020, 30% of the CIOs and company will see AI as a top five uh, priority. And once again, um, so there's um, this lady called um, Shivan Silis who um, got interested in this field a few years ago. And she, uh, went out and did a survey of the companies that use deep learning. So we see the chart that she made in uh, 2014, yeah, the 2014 up there, with all the companies that use deep learning. And then she um, did the same exercise a year later. And again, last year, 2016, she, she did the same uh, survey. And it's really, again, impressive to see how many more companies are using AI now. Just in, in two years, how many companies are actively using AI to drive their, their business and offer value to customers. So, um, so, so, so deep learning, how is it different? Well, there are several things. It requires much less domain knowledge to get valuable information out of data. Many more traditional approaches would require more manual feature engineering, so you would have to have an idea of what are the important things in data, how do I make the, the most informative features so that, that the model has reasonable input to start with. Networks that the deep learning um, with several neural networks stack, stack on top of each other do this automatically so, so that eliminates the manual trade engineering. Um, So yeah, so so that's um, that, that's basically actually the, the main uh, differentiator that uh, they can keep learning neural networks and learn all of these features intervention. And again, we see the improvement. So this is from um, a content um, a contest that runs every year, and we see the um, the errors on the, the y-axis at the time, on the x-axis at the errors are just decreasing year by year by year. Uh, so, so this is the performance of the winning um, entry in this competition. Now moving on to some applications. So, so first, um, I've just uh, sort of uh, recently really become convinced that deep learning really is a very big and very uh, quickly growing field. Um, so, so I, I used to be more. Um, I, I always thought it, it's a good tool, but uh, I, I might be more reserved about how useful a tool it actually is. So, I just wanted to talk a bit about some of the limitations. So, so of course, if you want to say uh, anything about causality, this is not the way to go. Uh, a lot of other methods are the same problem, of course. So, if you want to say anything about causality, um, deep learning might at least you have to tweak it a bit. Um, then if you, it needs data. So if you don't have a lot of data, you can, you're probably better with a, a smaller model with more assumptions, a more rigid model that, that um, is not as um, And then also if, if you have to have um, updates to the model quite frequently, deep learning might not be the way to go with it because it does take a long time to train the model. It also takes a longer time to um, make predictions with deep learning models compared to um, very simple models like uh, linear regression, but not nearly as long as it takes to train them. So um, those would be cases where you wouldn't use deep learning. On the other hand, there are many cases cases where deep learning would be a very good bet. If you have a lot of data, which as I mentioned, we have um, uh, quite more often now, if you have a lot of data, Deep learning might be able to help you find complex patterns in, the, in, in that amount of data. 
if you um, suspect a lot of uh, non-linear interactions in the data and very complex patterns, deep learning could be a way to go. Recently, I think last year or year before last, Google used the uh, deep learning to make a model of their, their server centers, their data centers. So, so they have a lot of recordings going many years back of their sensor measurements, the temperatures, the speed of the fans that cool the servers, um, a, a lot of sensor measurements. And their data centers use a lot of energy. So they uh, trained the deep learning model to predict if these sensor measurements are like this now, how much energy am I, am I using and how will the data centers uh, overall state be in the next few hours. They trained this deep learning model, they gave it to the operators, so the operators in the data centers can now try to uh, tune various parameters and then they'll get a prediction of, of what that will do to the data center in the future. And using this model, the operators were able to optimize the energy use so their, their total power consumption fell by 15%. So, so this is quite, um, quite impressive. There are also some caveats of deep learning. There are caveats of all models. I think one of the reasons that we must be, we have to be more aware of it with deep learning is because deep learning can really work so well. It can learn the training data set really well and, and learn the dis distribution of the data. But that also means that if you have data with biases in it, if you have a human language, you have a lot of biases. It turns out that a, a model was trained to uh, to learn um, to, to learn sort of what, what compares to another thing in language. And one of the things it learned was that father is to doctor as mother is to nurse. So essentially, it has, it has learned that all uh, that males tend to be doctors and females tend to be nurses. And this is probably a true bias in our la language, but it's not one that we want our models to learn. Imagine this model were then used to place job ads. Males would tend to be shown ads for doctors and females would be shown ads for nurses. And that, that, that might not be something that we're interested in. So you really have to consider your training data when you train a, a, a model. You, you will teach the model what the training data contains. The, so yeah, that's one thing. Then uh, there's another interesting thing. Um, these pictures. So here's what here's a, a column of pictures that are classified correctly by um, neural networks by deep learning models. Then there's uh, this column of noise, and when you add this noise to, to this column, you get these images. And as humans, humans, we can't tell any difference, but if you feed those images on the other side, and in the last column to a, to a neural network, it will misclassify them. It will get, get very, very wrong classifications. I don't remember the classifications. And other models may have the same problems. In mind, it's, it's not magical. You, you still have to uh, keep your human reasoning about this. So now going up to um, some of the awesome stuff that it does. Those two, that it doesn't very well. So, so this is a, just a survey from um, the Deep Learning 4 j framework authors where they look at which sectors used for which use cases are basically we just see that it's used for a lot of stuff like sound, sexual, text, image, video, it's used for I mean, all automotive settings for credit card form detection. And so here's one of the use cases which is mobile personalization. So if you um, so Google of course has Play Store and what what once in a while when you use Play Store you may know the app that you want on your phone and you just type in that name but oftentimes people don't know the exact app they want they just know sort of what sort of function they're looking for this so they search in it and they put in a text query. And Google had uh, apparently a lot of uh, difficulty finding out how to find the right apps to help solve this problem that the user was trying to, to solve. And for example, they, like, at some point, the, the, there's a game called Plants vs. Subtles that's not educational at all, but that was classified as educational by um, one of the older models from, um, from Google. So they, they ended up um, putting some research effort into this and coming up with this architecture which is um, a deep learning model 
uh, up here that takes uh, care of the generalization. And then there are some odd cases like the fans versus subdues. Uh, there are some weird interactions that do not fit into the generalization behavior that's in most of the training data. So you have to have a, a linear regression level with the um, interactions at the bottom. So that's actually sort of an interesting way to provide these things. And then there's um, anti fraud So banks are in charge of transactions. And uh, with uh, all the developing technology, more uh, mobile apps, more mobile payment solutions are also coming onto the market. And these are used more and more frequently to pay brands, to pay stores. This also makes it more, um, th this also makes it easier for uh, criminals to uh, to make more of these transactions. And with, with every fraudulent transaction, of course, the bank loses money. But if it's too strict and that's too many of the transactions as fraudulent, it will annoy customers. So this is uh, an important business use case for banks. You want to, you really want to um, only flag the transactions that are fraudulent and, and those who really want to catch, so you don't lose a lot of money. So instead of using the traditional approach, which was based on handwritten rules that people have figured out, we tried to work with the bank to use a more data-driven approach. And several model, models were tried out in this. So um, random forests were used, and um, recurrent neural networks were used in various technologies. And then the, the project was run as a first um, uh, simulated results. And the, the checking, challenge of testing, and the fact that finally the system was actually put into production. And uh, as, as far as I heard, it's actually doing well, better than the um, traditional handwritten rules. Then with this, so this is what uh, everyone is talking about in the media. You often see this so self driving cars. Will they be out next year? When will they be out? They probably won't be out next year, but a lot of car companies are looking to be ready to improve various aspects of driving. So there are several use cases in, in um, driving. You can put a lot of sensors on cars. You can put um, cameras and other things. And some of these things that deep learning can help with if you have cameras is when a car drives by, apple or congestion, a lot of uh, heavy traffic, the, the car might be able to recognize this automatically and tell the central server that, hey, look out for this area. There's a, so something's going on here. And then the central server could tell all the other cars with the same software, look out here. Maybe, maybe you want to try to find another route to avoid this heavy traffic. I think that's probably that, it, that deep learning could be used for cars as improving the environment within the, the car. Uh, making the temperature better suited to the person driving the car, um, such things. Oh yeah, and of course parking assistance, which we're already seeing in Tesla, but I'm actually not sure what Tesla uses. I was sort of trying to Google around, um, and people are talking about uh, Tesla's cars claiming to meet some training, so it seems that they may use some at least some machine learning approach, but I'm actually not quite sure if they use deep learning or not. But it, it would be a very obvious case. Automated check processing. So people still use checks. I'm not sure I've ever used one, but some people do still use and apparently that there are a lot of fixed costs associated with this. And as the volume of check check being processed decreases, the fixed costs will take up a larger a fraction of the total uh, cost for processing checks. So this is another use case where deep learning can drive costs down because a lot of the things involved in check processing are are obvious use cases for deep learning, like recognizing the head head writing, uh, recognizing the actual language processing. These are some of the problems that deep learning is is often cited as uh, being a good solution for.
So we we'll move on to some uh, conclusions and uh, some content about how we do deep learning at ThinkMake. So there, there are still some challenges in deep learning. It's uh, research driven, not another of the deep learning methods for our production license companies yet. Are actually popping up that offer deep learning solutions, but these solutions are packages. So they're probably very uh, suitable for small to medium sized companies that can afford these sort of standard solutions. But if you're a big company, you'll probably want a tailored solution that would, would, would keep learning to solve a problem that fits your needs exactly. And this is not very common yet. A lot of companies do not yet have tailored deep, solu deep, uh, deep learning solutions. And I'm not sure, I think, I think more and more companies are probably starting to do this, but it's not very, it's not very um, common yet. And uh, there is an access to talent, of course, so these would probably be some of the people in this room. But uh, there are not a lot of people who have a lot of hands and experience with deep learning yet. As I said, it's pretty recent. It's only in 2012 that it really started to pick up for image recognition. So that's all by now, four, five years ago, but still time to get into the field, really get to know it, really use it in projects. It takes a long time to really get to know the field, probably. And, uh, the, and if, so one thing is research and knowing it really well theoretically. Another thing is deploying it on systems where it has to run well. It has, it, it has to be up to production standards. So the the way that uh, we do it at Think Bank is we, we look at it in, in these spaces. And it's usually a six to twelve month project to, to move through all these phases. So there's a first validation phase where you want to look at what what's out there, what exists, what can we utilize in this this viable approach. Then you want to look more into how exactly would you would use the architecture. You would get more detail into the specific use case, and then um, and you would also look at uh, how how much uh, business value do you think this approach can gain for the business? Then there's the third phase, which is uh, putting some of this into live testing, looking at how is it actually performing, and then finally. A fourth phase of putting putting a system into production. Now, uh, another challenge in deploying deep learning solutions in production settings is that you need analytics up, which just refers to putting an analytics into production. And to do this, you need cross-functional teams. The, the business support of the company, the people making the the Business decisions need to see the, the value of deep learning to be able to see where can these solutions help the company. You, you need the data engineers, you need software programmers to actually do the programming. You need users of the software and of the solutions to, to tell you how do they ex how, how do they want the software to work. You of course need data scientists to, to help with the with Building the model, training it, and testing it, and so on. And, and you, you, you probably also need so many expert humans to say whether the results from the model are reasonable or not. So I think that, uh, so since there are so few people with the uh, hands on experience, we think of it in this uh, sort of uh, what new structure, I guess you could call it. So in the middle, we have dozens of experts who really focus on this area and make sure to stay up to date. They follow the research, they really know what's going on in the field. Then outside of that central circle, we have more than 200 practitioners who put deep learning into practice. But they don't also have time to really stay up to date with all the research. So they utilize the experts who are staying up to date. And then on the outer 
So I think we have a lot more people who have an idea of what deep learning can do, can help identify places where businesses might be able to derive value from deep learning and, so, and help to make this connection between deep learning and, and where businesses, businesses may derive value. So this is a sort of a summary of uh, where we see deep learning, where, where was it, where are we, and then where are we going. So as I mentioned before, we started with some research results in the start of this decade. Then the digital giants, Microsoft, uh, Facebook, Google started to invest more heavily in this, started to utilize deep learning more. Now we are at the stage where more companies are starting to use AI, more companies are becoming interested, looking at opportunities. We expect more companies to start using deep learning to drive business decisions in a couple of years. And then um, a bit more into the future from the 2020s, maybe we expect deep learning to be more present in society as a whole. So Amazon already has a store that they're beta testing in the, um, I don't remember where, somewhere in the US for their employees. So, so it's, a, it's a store, like a regular supermarket, but without any employees. So, uh, so when you go into the store, you have this app on your smartphone that you scan, and then you go into the supermarket, you take things off the shelves, you put them back, like you usually go to the store, and various deep learning models, video cameras, keep track of what's in your cart and what's Put back. So when you're not shopping, you just leave the store. And that's it. You don't wait in a line or anything. And then they will send you a bill to your Amazon account. So um, to, uh, to conclude, we see uh, AI still uh, moving forward. It's moving beyond labs into production. And I will just um, summarize without this, it's just points. And uh, we really feel that uh, you need a strategy and a roadmap to utilize AI to its fullest potential, know where you're going from the very beginning. Um, you might as well start now, pilot now, and build capabilities that you can um, keep building on moving, moving forward. So that's it. Thank you. Questions for Laura, the chance from the audience?